Broadcast Pioneers of Philadelphia is proud to induct posthumously these outstanding people into our Hall of Fame. Murray Arnold was one of Philadelphia's best-known communications figures. He played an integral part in the growth of both WIP and WPEN radio. His deep voice got him his first gig as an announcer at WIP. Murray then moved into the ranks of WIP management, then PD at WFIL, and on to WPEN radio as executive vice president. It's 1957. It was dawn all day on Wibbage. Donahue, Arthur, Wright, and Niagara. Doug Arthur, band leader, songwriter, disc jockey, Empress Serio. Doug's top-rated Danceland broadcast was heard twice daily on Wibbage. He later took the show to WCAU. A major highlight was Doug's selection as guest host on Martin Block's nationally known Make Believe Ballroom. It aired on WNEW, New York. Often referred to as a brilliant man, Raymond Bowley was truly a broadcast pioneer. At WPTZ, he was their chief engineer. He went to NYC when Channel 3 went to NBC. He started at W3XE in 1933. Raymond was audio and visual director of all Westinghouse Broadcasting radio and TV stations. He also manned one of the U.S. radar stations during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Jonathan P. Casey loved music. At a very young age, he listened to vinyl records on a record player given to him as a Christmas gift by his father, who worked at RCA in Camden. Casey spent his broadcast life serving the audiences in South Jersey, working five decades at various stations. South Jersey was a vital part of his life, and it came across in his broadcasts. Frank Cherkinian was expected to follow into the family business, but entertainment pulled him in a different direction. He took an assistant director's job at WCAU, where he quickly rose through the ranks. He later became a full-time CBS producer-director and would go on to produce and direct the network's coverage of tennis, football, basketball, and, of course, golf. Late in 1941, Betty Kilner Davis was in her senior year at Penn when her production company was approached by WPTZ, W3XE. She appeared in many of that station's early TV dramas at a time when Philly had only one station. She was one of the city's first television actresses and led the way for many others in future decades. She went on to have a full life in the world of business. It was 1952 when Mike Grant had two life-changing events. He married Dee, and they moved to Philadelphia and WCAU. He started as a staff announcer and then became WCAU's PD. Here, he worked with the likes of John Facenda, Herb Clark, Tom Brookshire, Ed Harvey, and Andy Musser. He played a vital part in the building of talk radio, especially at WCAU. The Grey Ghost Bob Knox was a mainstay at WIBG for decades. He wore many hats at the station, including that of disc jockey and news anchor. For a while, Bob was the morning newsman working with Bill Wright Sr. He became the director of broadcast standards until Storer sold the station. Then he stayed on for a few years more, working with automated programming. 
Kenneth Simmons worked at WYBG 87 years ago when it was church-owned. He engineered broadcasts for WCAU and CBS Radio. He was one of the early pioneers who installed the TV exhibit at the 1939 World's Fair. Then Simmons went to work for Milton Shapps Company, Gerald Electronics. He was instrumental in the early days of cable and authored the Bible for operating CATV. While these people are no longer with us, we will remember their accomplishments forever. The real pioneers of our broadcasting industry, ladies and gentlemen. We know we're really thrilled to have um, a few family members of some of these posthumous honorees, and we'd like to begin with introducing Nancy Krebs. Nancy is the daughter of Doug Arthur, and as you heard, Doug spent decades at WIBG Radio. Nancy, could you come forward, please? Nancy? Perhaps Nancy stepped out of the room. We'll move on to our next one. <laughs> Debbie Arnold, daughter of Murray Arnold. Murray was an announcer and in management is WIP, WFIL, and WPEN Radio. Debbie, could you come forward, please, to accept on behalf of your dad? Our dad was passionate about his job. He left for the station every morning at 6.30, and at 6.30 at night, we picked him up at the Radnor station and brought him home. At dinner time, he would read trade magazines, something my mom was not particularly proud of, and then he would set up a card table in front of the TV and go through the papers of the day. At night, a stack of three by five cards and a number three pencil sat by his bed, and in the morning, ideas for the day were spread all over the floor. He also claimed to have invented some things, including uh, helicopter traffic reporting. And as a child, I was fortunate enough to get up in the WPE and helicopter and persuade the pilot to fly over our house. As we got closer and closer, uh, my mom came out and started to wave. And as we got closer and closer and closer, we could see that she was in her baby doll powder blue pajamas, <clears throat> a sight that is frozen in my head forever. Um, but on behalf of my mom, who's still in California, my sister and I, who flew in from California, we'd like to say thank you. My dad would have been so proud. It's now my pleasure to introduce Raymond Bowley, the son of Ray Bowley. He is accepting on behalf of his dad. Raymond? <laughs> Good evening, I know it's getting late, uh, but I know my father would be very proud to be recognized for his contributions to the broadcast industry. 
He was a brilliant electronics engineer, received many awards for his innovations to TV broadcasting. He had patents and citations from the government for the development of over-the-horizon radar and also for the development of the equipment <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that allowed the Allies to jam German communications during D-Day and beyond. Dad was fortunate to be involved. Thank you. With W3XE, an experimental station, uh, and he started to work for Philco in 1933. And he worked for Philco until 1941, uh, at which time they became the third commercial TV station and the largest station in Philadelphia. On behalf of the Bally family, my family, thank you for the, this recognition. And in the words often spoken by my father, we wish you peace and contentment. Thank you very much. Joining us next is Carl Hempel. Carl is coming from another state, from New Jersey. He's the general manager of WVLT, cruising 92.1 in Violent. He accepts on behalf of Jonathan P. Casey. WVLT was the last station Casey worked at. Jonathan Casey spent 40 years serving the people of South Jersey at numerous stations in the area. Carl? <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, I was real privileged when Jerry called me because of the fact that um, Casey's son, who lives in Texas, couldn't make it here this evening. But I was telling one of the board members, Steve Tatz, who's on the board for the Pioneers, my goodness, I'm a South Jersey broadcaster. I'm not used to talking to so many polished speakers, so many talented people that are here. But I'll do my best to give the honor to Jonathan P. Casey, who's well deserving of this honor. I'm proud to accept this for his family, for his friends, also for the Bold family at WSNJ, where he worked for 20 years. He did an outstanding job there. I also would like to um, thank the uh, pioneers and the selection committee for selecting Jonathan P. Casey, especially selecting someone who's in a small radio market area. Just as this gentleman was saying over here, you're honoring DJs that are on the air, but you're also honoring other people like engineers and other people in that area. And now we're honoring some of the small market people, right? Agree with that? Yes. <laughs> I just think it's outstanding that they're starting to uh, take a view of some of the, the small market people because they are talented. Some of you people in the Philadelphia market don't understand what the small market DJs go through. They have to do a lot of different things, a lot of different jobs. For example, when Jonathan P. Casey was working at WSNJ and WVLT, he would do a country news store. He would also do a show called The Jersey Boys, which was a talk show, it wasn't a music show. Then, of course, he did the music DJ show, and he's very knowledgeable on music. He often tells me he taught Tom McCarthy everything that he knew. And Tom McCarthy, of course, is in your Hall of Fame. He also did uh, interviews with politicians. So I'm trying to make a point is a lot of you probably don't know Jonathan B. Casey, but he was an outstanding personality in the broadcast market in the South Jersey area. And I'll just sign up with this one. The last few days that he was in the hospital, <clears throat> I was visiting him. And his show time was coming up, and he said, if I can't make my show, can you please do it from the hospital room? And I said, we'll see what we can do. And of course, he passed away two days later. But I'm sure he would like to say this. This is how he signed off on every show that he had all the years he was on as a DJ for the music part. Life is what you make it, no more or no less. So get out and make the best of it every day. Thank you. 
It's uh, my pleasure now to introduce Philip Todd. He accepts on behalf of Betty Kellner Davis. He is a filmmaker doing a film about her life. Betty was an actress three quarters of a century ago on W3XE and WPTZ during the Second World War. Philip Todd, please come forward. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, I accept on behalf of Betty's daughter, uh, Petey, who could not be here tonight because she is ill and lives in Georgia and could not make the trip. Um, I grew up next to Betty Davis, and she was like an extra parent who lived next door. And as far as I knew, she worked at a bank. And I returned, uh, went off to college and returned to Philadelphia five years ago and visited her in her uh, retirement home, and she started telling me this incredible story about how when she was in college, she had been an actress in uh, some kind of television program. And this, uh, she brought out some photos, which we saw tonight. Um, and the next day, I brought cameras over and had her tell me the whole story um, in, very, in, a lot of in a lot of detail. And um, I then did a little Googling and found out that this TV show was the world's first soap opera that she had been able to take part of. And uh, for someone who had spent her career working in business, she talked very fondly of her days in early television, recounting how there was no studio, there were uh, just offices, the backgrounds were, the sets were all painted, nothing was, was real. Um, she wore her street clothes that she had worn in off the street, and that's what was her wardrobe on camera. And when they were finished, uh, they were given a token to get home on the, uh, on the subway, and maybe if they were lucky, they got treated to a hamburger in the cafeteria. And uh, this work she did for Philco um, was, um, a summation of it was in these photos that they sent her, um, and a little Philco radio that they gave her when the production was finished. They terminated production of last year's nest uh, because of the war effort and the equipment was needed elsewhere. And she went on to find uh, a career in business. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank very much Jerry Wilkinson, Brad Seekoff for documenting her story so beautifully, Bill Kelly who welcomed her when I first brought her to Broadcast Pioneers, and Dave Abramson who took a great interest in her story and had some memorabilia that uh, had her name on it. And she was tickled pink by everything that the broadcast pioneers did for her. And um, it's a great honor to receive this award on behalf of her family. Thank you all very much. Uh, I guess the last person gets to take as long as they want, right? Uh, no, really. no. <laughs> um, I, as fate would have it, tonight is the 29th anniversary of my father's death. Um, now, it's 29 years. But more importantly is the fact that uh, thanks goes to Jerry Wilkinson and the board of um, the, the, or this organization who had the, the foresight uh, several years ago to change the format of, of the Hall of Fame and allow for those who passed on to be able to be recognized. And um, for those other eight individuals who were inducted tonight along with my father. I'm sure that they very much appreciate the fact that that was changed. They are, in fact, the true pioneers of, of what is now broadcasting today. As far as my father is concerned, <clears throat> he was um, the gray ghost when I knew him best. He was Bobcat Bob Knox in the 1940s when he was playing uh, swing and um, uh, later, um, my, uh, when I knew him uh, as, as my dad, uh, it was more about the records he would bring home um, for us to listen to. Um, in the end, um, as I think back on him as in his career, uh, it was less a, an issue of him being a great broadcaster and disc jockey, which he was, uh, and um, it also was the fact that he was 
uh, a good dad and he was a good man. And I think that in the end, um, what we do, period, is, is uh, the exclamation point is whether we're good at, at being human beings. And I, one last thing, I'd like to thank Bill Wright for, uh, and Jerry for recognizing my father, uh, kind of taking him out of the closet of uh, the dust, it dusted him off to, to allow him to be part of this august organization. Uh, I know wherever he is tonight, he is smiling and happy and very thankful to, to all of you and the organization for this great honor. Thank you.